As I told you earlier, um, one of the, the great things I think about today is that we're having this opportunity to hear from two um, uh, other state system projects. Um, thanks again to Jerry Hanley for the insights that he provided us earlier this morning. Our second keynote speaker is Lucy Harrison, and I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce her. Um, one of the things we say about the system in Maryland, if we had to compare ourselves to another state system, the closest would probably be Georgia. Um, in many respects, they're made up very much like we are um, and made up of a mix of institutions very much like the, the public higher ed institutions here in the state of Maryland. Um, Lucy. Harrison is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Library Services for the University System of Georgia and the Executive Director of a project called Galileo, which is Georgia's virtual library. Affordable Learning Georgia, we've heard about Affordable Learning uh, California, now the Affordable Learning Georgia ALG program, a University System of Georgia initiative that's run through Galileo has saved college students in Georgia over $40 million and is helping to increase student success across the state. Lucy's previous roles have included Director of Library Services and Interim Dr Executive Director of the Florida Academy, uh, uh, excuse me, Florida Academic Library Services Cooperative at the Florida Virtual Campus and Interim Chief Operating Officer for the College Center for Library Automation. Please join me in welcoming Lucy to the stage. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, let me set my uh, stopwatch here so I can keep to time as much as possible. Thank you for inviting me here today. I thought I had like the longest title in the world, but Jerry and MJ have a very similar title, so I'm gonna stop complaining about it. Um, so obligatory slide about my, my organization, where I'm from. Um, I, the Affordable Learning Georgia program is part of Galileo, which is part of the University System of Georgia. We represent the 26 um, public um, higher ed institutions of the university system. We have a board of regents, we have a chancellor. We, Galileo, which is the library um, side of the organization, has been around since 1994. ALG is our newest program. It's been fully funded since 2015. As of right now, we have two full-time staff in our Affordable Learning Georgia program. Um, one of those we're about to be hiring for. So one of them's about to retire, and we'll be hiring somebody new if you have anybody who's uh, interested in moving down to Georgia. And then, of course, there's a lot of support from the larger Galileo organization. Myself, um, we have um, marketing communications folks that pitch in. We have um, web developers and so on and so forth. So this is, you've probably all seen this chart before, this is the problem that we were sort of charged with trying to address, which is the cost of commercial textbooks rising at a pace that far outstrips the rate of inflation. I know there's been some argument over how much exactly is it costing students each year, but regardless of whether you agree with these numbers or not, it's a lot of money. Students are spending a lot of money on commercial textbooks. So um, Jerry showed you the 2018 version of this survey, I believe. Um, full disclosure, I used to work at this organization before I came to Georgia. I was at the Florida Virtual Campus. So um, what, what we're showing here is that you know, in a system where all of the emphasis is on increasing graduation rates, increasing student success, when students, two thirds of them, are choosing not to buy required textbooks, they're not gonna do as well in the class when they are choosing to take fewer classes, it's going to take them longer to graduate. So this is a, a, a slide that has had a lot of impact in our state. Um, as far back as 2011, the Board of Regents were proactively looking at ways to help address this, and uh, Marie Lassiter, whose report was done in 2011, she's the one who's gonna be retiring here shortly. Um, so we uh, looked at open textbooks as a way to address this, uh, you know, what, eight years ago? Um, brief history of, of how we got to where we are. We started in 2012 with a Complete College Georgia initiative. Many states have similar initiatives, you know, trying to get students to um, get through graduation um, faster, um, retain students, um, get them out into the workforce more quickly. 2013, we piloted a project on textbook affordability. Um, 2014, we put our uh, Georgia uh, campus champions and library coordinators in place. So we asked the provost at each institution to identify somebody from the library and somebody who was a OER champion or could be, grow into an OER champion on campus. And then we used that as our kind of initial community that has changed over the years, but we used that as our kind of um, sounding board and uh, a community that we're gonna use to help grow this. 
And then in the 2014-15 ac um, academic year, we partnered with another USG initiative called ECORE. So we have, um, this is an opt-in program for the university system to, uh, to provide the um, Gen Ed core courses online, greatly reduced tuition. Um, they all use the same textbooks. Even though it's opt-in, I think 23 of the 26 are, are members at this point. So this was sort of an already established um, very consistent way of delivering materials, and we partnered with them to get all of their textbooks available, ideally OER, um, but at least at no charge to the students. So what we discovered through all of this, through our initial pilots and through our work with ECOR and others, was that faculty need first to know that open educational resources are a thing. There was um, a, not a great deal of awareness about what OER were. Then they need the time for themselves or working in a team to go ahead and move their courses to one that uses OER or low cost materials. So here's just an example of others assistance that they may need to bring in as well. And then eventually recognizing them for their work in through tenure promotion and so on and so forth. And I will say that this last one is something that we're still struggling with. So you should see a lot of, you know, comparison, a lot of um, what Jerry was saying this morning reflected here as well. If you hear both of us say it, um, which you will through this, you know, I think you can take that to the bank. If we're both saying this is important, you can definitely, definitely count on that. So ALG was funded then fully in 2015, um, and where our focus was on reducing the cost of textbooks, as well as some enhancement of the Galileo Library Services as well. So uh, we wanted, our core strategies have been from the beginning to provide incentives through grants to uh, incentivize instructors to redesign their courses around low cost or free materials. Build an engaged community of educators. We started there with those campus champions and library coordinators. Partner with other leaders around the group, around the state rather, so ECOR will be one example, but we are partnering with others, including university presses, um, the faculty learning communities that are, that are um, going on in other areas of pedagogy. Ultimately, our goal is to reduce the cost of textbooks to students and increase their student success. So we have the grants that I mentioned, which is our primary mechanism of, um, of uh, incentivizing faculty. We have three different sizes. Standard is up to 10,800, and that is for um, a normal class, a team of faculty. Um, it's gonna, if you, we have a large, a large grant as well, which is up to 30,000, which is only if more than 500 students are gonna be affected in a year on an ongoing basis. And that's typically outside, and they don't all, you know, we have, a, we have a process by which they, uh, they apply for these grants, so not everybody gets the full, the full amount. But that's kind of the where we max out. Um, and then we have a new category called mini grants that we just implemented, which is for kind of going back if something needs to be updated, if there's some ancillary materials that need to be created, um, but it's not a full implementation, then we have a mini grant, which is up to 4,800. Um, so uh, this is to support faculty time, travel, materials, additional support that they may need. And again, we don't necessarily fund the full amount. They submit a proposal. That proposal goes through a peer review process. And then um, the, the reviewers recommend particular projects. We take a look at it and kind of run it through another screen, making sure the same institution is not getting all the grants, um, making sure that if there are things that are supporting other initiatives throughout the system, that those get maybe a little extra boost. And then we um, do a contract. The contract is with the institution, not with the instructor, in case the instructor leaves, which has happened. At this point, all 26 of our institutions have been awarded grants at some point. We've had 470 applications, and we were able to fund 307 of those. So the um, proposal that's submitted becomes a statement of work. Um, the statement of work gets attached to a service level agreement with the institution, and then we give half the funds at the beginning of the work and half the funds once the final report is submitted. And the final report is only submitted once the course has actually been taught using the materials. Today, how's it going? Well, um, I think I told MJ 40 million, our recent data is in, we're now up to 55 million um, that has been saved on textbook costs. Over 330,000 students have benefited. And if all of the grants that we have currently funded keep going, that will be 20 million a year. Now I said if, not all the grants that we have ever funded do continue, but if they all did, that would be 20 million annually just with the grants that we funded so far. A couple of um, specific success stories, Georgia State, we had students, this was a math class where the two books were costing $184. Um, they had a large number of students, so that alone is saving over a million annually. 
We had, um, this is a much fewer students, 720 students, but this is an example where the books, $361, cost more than the tuition in the class, okay? So this, for those 720 students, that was a huge barrier that now they don't have to pay. And then Open Mathematics in Action was an example of a collaborative larger grant. We had five institutions coming together on that. And um, again, a large number of students, this one's still going. Um, so saving over 1.4 million annually. It's not just about the money though, it's also about student success. So students really like these materials. Um, can, you, can you read that okay? It says 93.3% uh, positive, so students really, really like them. Now, they might like them because they're free. <laughs> that, that might be part of it. But uh, they were either 100% positive or neutral. And then we also looked at, let's see, this one is student learning outcomes. So this had to do with how did their test grades or their grades change as a result of the course. And again, we see that um, almost 60% actually increased the student outcomes, about another 37, 38% were the same as with a commercial textbook, and we only saw about a 4.4% um, decline. So this is really, really good, you know. Um, this is from our rounds 9 through 11. We are currently up to round 14, but those have not yet submitted their final reports. This data comes in through the final reports. And then also changes in DFW rates, sort of similar sort of, you know, a, you know, some, a big chunk did better than with the commercial textbooks, and an, another big chunk did about the same as they did with commercial textbooks. And of course, they're not having to pay for those textbooks. And also, this is a study um, that um, Eddie Watson did recently. Um, he used to be at uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning at UGA. He's now at the American Association of uh, Research Libraries, I think. Um, and so he looked at, specifically at UGA, long-term study comparing the same course, same instructor, um, what did it, how did students do before versus after the shift to to a, a open or low-cost textbook. I think he was looking specifically at open. And what he saw is yes, everybody did better, everybody liked it, everybody's grades increased, but for students who were at the most risk and the most dependence on financial aid, so first generation in college, minor minority students, they did even better, right? It kind of leveled the playing field for them. And this, um, this, this research paper is available online. He released it openly. So the libraries have always been an important part of this. We've had that library coordinator role from the beginning since even before we were um, you know, fully uh, funded, permanently funded. Um, so these folks you know, attend monthly meetings, they attend webinars that we put on, we have an email list that they're on along with our campus, um, campus champions. And then they're often part of the grants team as well. You know, if we see a grant coming forward and there's a, you know, they've made time to include a librarian, that's, that's excellent. Um, they come to our conferences and symposiums that we put on. We also, though, see them as being, playing this role of content curator expert that they would be playing anyway for the institution. So they've all, they already are the ones who are knowledgeable and expert in what instructors could use in their classes. Um, they've been playing that role forever, um, but they are, you know, anything that's in the library is free to students, like Jerry. You know, part of my, my, the other half of my job is with Galileo, which is providing that library content through eBooks and academic journals and academic databases to the entire state. That's all free. Um, but then, it, and we've also worked hard to integrate that into faculty workflows already. So an example there would be we provide um, the EBSCO discovery service to the entire state and they have a tool called Curriculum Builder that we have integrated seamlessly into the learning management systems of the 26 institutions. So that from within the place that they are building their course shell, they can immediately find library resources and pull them in. And um, we're going to be looking at how do we make open, they're already in there, but how do we make them more visible and easier to select from within that, that framework. Um, so I already talked about the integration tools. So by 2016, which is the time I showed up at Galileo, I was at the Florida Virtual Campus before that, um, we were already an established program and our next charge was kind of to scale up and start moving from beyond a startup, beyond pilot into to long-term success. So we wrote a three-year strategic plan that had five main goals and I'm gonna run through, I'm gonna bundle two of them together, but I'm gonna run through each of them real quick here. So the first one was to um, raise awareness of OER no-cost, low-cost resources. As I said, a lot of faculty weren't even aware of you know, what OER are, what open textbooks are, or they might have a very outdated idea of what they are. 
So we did a survey, this is our most recent survey, um, we did it in 2018, and 60% of USG faculty reported being at least somewhat aware of OER. I've mentioned the other main findings there too, but this is the one I'm going to focus on right now. So that's actually much better than the national average, but that still leaves a gap of 40% that apparently have no idea what OER are. So um, we need to keep focusing on that. So part of our awareness efforts, again, going back to that lo those library coordinators and campus champions, we have a newsletter that goes out, you know, an e-newsletter e that goes out regularly. We also integrate ourselves into other university system events. Um, you know, whenever we can, we're like, put us on the agenda. So for example, there is a, um, a initiative going on right now where the chancellor has named learning scholars at each campus. We've shown up at their events and said, hey, let's talk about open pedagogy, open educational resources. There are faculty learning communities that are um, uh, doing research around various pedagogies. We've shown up there. We've talked to them about what um, open educational resources can do for them. We have our um, gateway to completion, which is an effort where they are redesigning courses um, to try and make them um, work better for students and get them through faster. And we're saying, if you're already redesigning your course, why not throw in this extra, this extra you know, little bit of effort to make it be um, using open educational resources, and we'll actually fund you to do that. And then uh, we have a new, um, he's not that new now, he's been there two years, um, a new um, chief academic officer, my boss, Tristan Denley, and he came in with a whole set of um, ideas around momentum year, around engaging students from the first moment they step foot on campus, around in and encouraging them to take those you know, 15 credits to um, redesign the undergraduate courses, so the early undergraduate courses, so that students were getting direct experience in what they were interested in in their first year on campus, as opposed to taking stuff that may or may not apply to them down the road. So again, as people are thinking this through about how are they going to redesign their courses to, to fit into this momentum year approach, we're there saying, hey, and why not also in, in, consider moving to a free or low cost textbook? We also um, are fortunate to be associated with a statewide, very successful conference called the Teaching and Learning Conference. We sponsor a track at this each year. We um, have an OER presence woven throughout the conference, um, so that goes really well as well. We uh, occasionally will sponsor attendance at other events and courses. There was a Creative Commons licensing um, event recently where we said, hey, anybody want to go this? Well, at the institutions, we will sponsor at least um, two people at each institution to go. The other thing that we did, and Jerry mentioned this as well, but um, so starting last fall, we required that each institution prominently designate courses with either no cost, free, or low cost materials at the point of registration. So as students go to register for their class, they're gonna see this flag. They already see this flag, um, whether it's no cost or low cost course mater required materials. So this gives students options. You know, if they're making the choice between paying $300 for a textbook or nothing, they may choose to take the nothing course. Um, it's also helpful for us in our data analysis and ongoing assessment. And of course, it raises awareness. There's a big um, peer pressure component to this. The idea was that you know we need to make sure everybody sees this and it's front and center. We're not going to force people to move to open resources, but let's prod them gently in that direction. So it was optional in summer 2018, required in fall 2018. I've now seen the data from both fall and spring. Um, so the, just if you're interested, the way we did it was in Banner. Everybody uses Banner, so we just put a code in there. Um, we did, gave training, we, uh, we have FAQs on our website. Nobody had any trouble getting that code in Banner. 100% of institutions got the code into their Banner system on the back end. Um, Many of them had issues on how it was displaying to students or um, how, how the courses were being coded. So there were, um, we, we saw some weird things like one institution that had 1,400 courses coded as um, no cost in the fall dropped down to like 14 courses in the spring. So that is, one of those things is not correct. <laughs> um, we also saw some is issues with student interfaces. With, they were kind of all over the place. Um, we had some institutions like Columbus State University down in Columbus who did a fantastic job. It's 
beautiful. Students can select, you know, I only want to search for courses that are no cost or I want to search for both no cost and low cost along with many, many, many other attributes they can search and then they display in this beautiful interface. It's absolutely gorgeous. Other, other folks didn't display it at all to students even though the information was there on the back end um, and other people did thing, weird things like I'm just going to stick the code on there. That's the NCM code and students will figure out what that means. So we've continued to work with them to try and get some consistency around that. Um, what we did was we sent a kind of a customized report to each provost and said, here's how your implementation looks. We would ask that you look at this and this and, and please do, um, you know, then we'll, we'll check again, you know, once the summer data comes in. Um, there were also some questions around the requirements, not around, the, everybody knew what free meant. The questions were around the, what does low cost mean? So these are an example of some of the questions we got here. You know, what if it's, a, I can get it somewhere for under $40, but the bookstore charges is more than that. What if it, you can rent it for 40, but the purchase price is more. What if the library has a copy? This was a big one. You know, to which I said, well, what if everybody had to access that library copy at the same time? If it's a required book and there's one copy in the library, no, that doesn't count. But if it's you know, an ebook that's available to everybody, sure. Or if the library has enough copies to cover everybody in the class, okay. Or if they only need you know, one chapter and they could reasonably you know, copy it um, you know, at, at low cost, then that would be fine too. Um, why did we choose $40? You know, what if the instructor changes? What about academic freedom? You can't tell me what to do. And that's true, we don't, we can't. But all we're saying here is if you're doing this, then we want to know about it. I had, um, I was in front of one group of people, the, I think this was the, um, I think this was the academic affairs group, and one faculty member actually stood up and said, I just don't think this is fair because if a student can see, is looking at my class and I charge $300 for this textbook, and then they can see that it's the same course as offered in, you know, by my colleague for, with no cost for the textbook, they're gonna take that other course. And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> So um, the processes, I will say, also differed widely on campuses. Um, you know, textbook pricing is gathered by different people. We do have a general requirement in the state that, um, that this information be available online to students prior to class starting, but how that got interpreted at each institution is very different, so we might need to uh, look at maybe getting some better process around that. The deadlines for when they have to submit the textbook pricing to the bookstore, for example, varied widely. Um, so we are going to be, we've already updated and communicated FAQs on the requirements and the process. Those are on our website. We have, as I said, shared a customized institutional report to each institution to say this is how you're doing on this. Longer term, we'd like to maybe create some kind of web tool because everybody's on banner. Maybe we could create some kind of tool that will help them gather that information and then get it uploaded into banner easily. So that was the raising awareness part. Um, supporting OER implementation and creation, mostly what we're doing here is our grants process. That's how we're, that's how we're moving forward with that. Um, however, we also have um, a new partnership with um, an accessibility center in the state. Um, it's CIDI, Center for Interactive Design and implementation, I think. So we are working with them to make sure that all of the textbooks that are created as part of our grant process are um, fully accessible. And, you know, of course, what does accessible mean? There's different levels of accessibility, but um, we are working with them to figure out what that means. We also have a new program that we're piloting right now. Have any of you heard of reacting to the past or reacting games? Okay, so these are, um, it's, a, it's a methodology where students, um, in a particular class kind of play a role. It's like a role-playing game as part of the class, and it can be just a single class period. It sometimes is like a week, or it could be over the entirety of the class. So if you're studying you know, ancient Rome, somebody might be you know, Caesar, and you know, you're not only, you have to do enough research that you can kind of act as Caesar in different scenarios. So these are called reacting games, reacting to the past games, and we've been working with the reacting consortia to um, figure out a new way of making these open. They are, many of them are published by um, Norton, and they're not super expensive already, but we're funding a couple of grants to create open versions of these games um, that will be available to anybody. We're also working on full degree programs. So um, we're working, well, I mentioned eCore 
those are those you know, gen ed core classes that are that are um, available on an opt-in basis um, for for the institutions that are participating. They also have an e-major program, which is collaborative online majors. So we are working with them. Um, we just identified um, nine textbooks that we're going to be creating with them. They have a leadership program that has three different tracks. We'll be creating nine textbooks with them, and we're partnering with the University of North Georgia Press on this too. So um, the way that this works is that um, the e major folks will kind of be the subject matter experts, and then the University of North Georgia Press we will contract with to provide the professional press services. So the you know the, the design, the publishing, gra any graphics that are needed, um, peer review, anything that goes through our UNG that is published in the collaborate, I'm sorry, collaboration with us in the UNG Press will go through a formal peer review process, which helps, of course, with that tenure and promotion, because it, it looks like a tr more traditional textbook. And then we're also focusing on what we're calling department level scale ups. So we've given a lot of grants at this point. I think it was 307, did I say? And you know, oftentimes we will give a grant to a particular course in a department, and that course, or maybe some, a couple of courses will be using it, but there'll be other courses in the same department, same course, using a commercial textbook. We would like to reach out to those areas where we feel we can make the most impact and say, hey, you've already got this professor over here successfully using an OER textbook for this you know, Psych 1101 class. Why not take a little bit more money from us and get all of your professors in the department teaching that course on board? So we're using some of our data. This is our using our no-cost um, data here. Um, I realize you can't read this at all now that I'm looking at it. But basically, the teal colored circles are the full um, enrollment in a particular course. And then the dark black colored circles are how much of that is n using no cost materials. So you can see over, um, I'm not going to try and I'm too scared to do it. Over here, so the, the kind of over to the far right here, you can see that almost all of the courses are, almost all of this, the enrollment is actually students using no cost materials. But you look at something um, close to the middle there where the, uh, the circle is just a little bit over the line and then the, the big, big circle at the top, that means there's a lot, we have an adoption, but we have a lot of room to grow there. So we'll be reaching out to these departments, and this is for just one school, I think this is Georgia Highlands, and saying, hey, for that class, which I can't read either, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> why not consider taking another grant and getting all of your instructors on board to teach that course using OER? And then we'll also be looking at doing that um, at the system level. So this one you can maybe read a little bit better. What we did here was we looked at across the system, are there opportunities to take an entire class to OER, um, or at least heavily encourage people to do that. So um, we have, this is, uh, I think it says American history, American government maybe? Uh, American government, two English classes, and on the far right is the psychology one. So if we had, right now we have 2,975 students in Intro to Psych using no-cost textbooks for a savings of $342,000 across the system. If we were able to take that system-wide, we would get 28,773 students for a saving of 3.36 million, okay? Now, we're not gonna get there because of academic freedom, because of institutional choices, but what we'd like to do is work with the subject matter committee. Um, we have a Regents Academic Committee on Psychology. We're gonna work with them to understand what their requirements are and make sure we can say that we have open materials to hit every single one of those. If they say, oh, well, we can't use it because of this, then we'll say, well, we're going to do this then, right? We're going to create this. We're going to work with you to create this so that there's no excuse not to be using these open educational resources in this class. Any possible objection that anybody can have will realistically have been, have been covered. The other thing we wanted to do was expand and improve our data collection, analysis, and reporting. So again, those no-cost and low-cost indicators have helped with that. I will say, again, the low-cost data, I think, is really problematic right now. People are having a really hard time with that. The no-cost seems to be pretty straightforward. People don't really have a problem with that. So that's where we're focusing on for right now, and then trying to improve the, the collection of the, the low-cost data. We also worked really closely with our Board of Regents budget staff, right? So we were reporting out you know, these fantastic numbers of saving you know, tens and tens and millions of dollars a year, um, but we needed to make sure that they were comfortable with those numbers. So we took a really close look at our data, worked with them, and we are reporting, the numbers we're reporting now are very, very conservative. If it has not been actively confirmed as it was a grant that we provided and that 
that those grant materials are still actively being used in the class and it has to be proactively confirmed. We have to, we can't just assume that's the only time we're reporting it out. So the numbers that we're saving are on the low end because they could have been adopted someplace else and we don't know about it. It could be continuing and they just didn't tell us it's been continuing. We also created a new data center and I'm actually gonna jump out of the presentation here and show this to you. Let me end slideshow. So if you go to our Affordable Learning Georgia website, um, which is conveniently affordablelearninggeorgia.org, um, this is our, the main site right here. And then we have uh, you know, our three, we have our repository of open learning materials, we have statistics, research, and reports, we have information about the grants, those are the main three things. We have a direct link to our data center over here on the about um, page. We also have, um, if you're interested in those FAQs about the course catalog designators, those are right here. But I'm going to show you the data center real quick. Um, because we are, one of, our, one of our values is openness and transparency at Galileo. So we have everything out on the web. So down here we have um, um, a B Power BI version of the reports. So you can see here, and this is, um, through fall 2018. So let me go back to, this is four different slides. So here you can see the student savings by each institution in each subject area by academic year. And I know it looks like we took like a massive dive here in this last year. We didn't, we just don't have the last half of the year up there yet. And then the, that was um, student savings. This is number of students affected. This is total grants awarded by institution. This one's taking a little while to load there. And then this is the um, information I showed you about the student, le student learning outcomes. So this is um, that data about you know, how the students changed, and their student perceptions changed, how their retention changed, and you can select a specific subject area if you're interested, a specific institution, a specific round of grants. All of that's out there. You can look at it, do whatever you would like. Um, the other thing we have is the actual spreadsheet that all of this is pulling from. So it's, it's massive. Um, here it is. So just, I just want to show here kind of our, our methodology for how we're having to go back and get everything. So here's kind of our, the, the, big, the, big, uh, the big news here, you know, $45,000 in confirmed grant savings, plus the work we're doing with OER is another $10 million. Um, we have our you know, data definitions down here. We have um, you know, by, by year. And then if you go to the different tabs, you can see every single grant we've ever awarded. How many students? Is it still in progress? Um, let me see. Let me go back up to the front and scroll over a little bit. The other thing I wanted to show you here was this. So remember I said we only count it if it's confirmed. So you can see that we have a few grants early on that we don't know. The instructors left um, or didn't respond to us. We can't track it down. A few things have been discontinued. Not everything that we fund is going to stay forever. But we got, we've had you know, pretty good success here. So all of that's available on the website. And then the other thing is that we went, and this was a great marketing tool, we created specific reports for each institution. So you look at somebody like Georgia Highlands College, we just used that data, plugged in a beautiful template that shows them this is how you're doing, Georgia Highlands. And you can see how many, what your cumulative savings are, how many students have been affected, you know, how are you ranking against your peers in the state? And then um, grants by subject area, and then here's a list of specific grants. So this is something that administration can take a look at and see quickly how are they doing. All right, back to the slideshow. And again, all of that is available on our website. Anybody can get there and look at it. Um, and then the last thing we were going to do, where we, the last strategy that we're looking at is supporting development of open pedagogy and new technology. So OER enabled pedagogy is kind of brand new, and this is what we're starting to talk about with our faculty learning communities, with this uh, chancellor's learning scholars. You know, as we as we are speaking with the people who are redesigning their classes, we're saying why not redesign your classes to not only use an open textbook, but also take advantage of the things that you can do, the different ways your students can learn, because 
they are using an open textbook because we have the five R's here. So one of the examples that we're, we're using here is renewable assignments. You think about a typical assignment, a student writes a paper, the instructor reads it, they get a grade, it's thrown out, nobody ever uses it again. What a waste of time and effort and energy, right? What if they could create something that would actually go beyond just getting a grade in the course, but actually be helpful and useful? So these are new artifacts, essays, poems, videos, songs that are either open from scratch, they built it themselves, or remixing or revising an existing OER. And then they're invited to publicly share those, make them OER, and the, be, be able to be available for other people to do something with. So a few examples here. And let me say, these are not examples from the university system. We are just starting having this conversation. These are examples from the world at this point. But an open textbook would be an example. This is a project management for instructional designer textbook that was based on a project management textbook and the point of the class, the students in the class, their assignment was take this open project management textbook and create from that a project management for instructional designers textbook. The end of the class, they finished, they got their grade, and a new resource was available for anybody to use in the world. Another a very common one that people, many people are using already and may not realize it's a renewable assignment is creating Wikipedia entries. So this was a Spanish literature class, and the goal of the class was to create, um, to expand or create new Wikipedia entries that were good enough to be considered a featured article in Wikipedia, which is apparently a big deal. So this, this one was, this one was a featured article in Wikipedia, and now it exists out there for anybody to use. Um, another example would be creating like worked math problems that then can be used in Wikipedia or other places. And my favorite, having students create their own test test questions. Um, so this was an um, uh, you know, example of an instructor explaining why he has students write their own test questions. So this is an open, open materials, as we know, often don't come with very deep test banks of questions. But his, his feeling here is that if a student knows enough about the subject to not only write a question and the correct answer, but also up to three plausible alternative answers, then they really understand the question, right? So why not have students write their own test questions? You got 20 students in the class, yeah, they'll know the answer to you know, one out of 20 of the questions, but they won't know the other 19. So moving forward, what are we gonna do? We are constantly wanting to improve the OER quality and scope. We want to get more ancillary materials available to instructors. Um, we created that mini grant program, as I said, specifically to try and create more ancillary materials. Also, we are hoping to create textbooks in better, more accessible formats, as I mentioned, but also more responsible, responsive and editable formats. I was hoping to have an announcement for you today, but I can't quite announce it yet, but I hope we will have a new platform that we'll be piloting soon that will allow for some of this. Those department and system level scale-ups that I mentioned are a, a big part of what we're gonna be focusing on in the next year but also a reinvestment in just the basic awareness and training. You know, there's instructors, I don't know, you know, I, I like everywhere, we have a lot of adjuncts, we have a lot of new faculty, we have turnover, so we need to go back to the basics and remind people, you know, this is, that we can't just keep moving forward with the more interesting and exciting open pedagogy, we also have to be continu continuously reaching back out and reminding people of the basics. Um, we do have a few areas where resources are scarce, as, as upper level courses, for example, you know, it's, you can't get to a full Z degree program unless you have those upper level courses, but the return on the investment is not necessarily always there because they have fewer students in them. So how are we gonna deal with that? Although we are, the chancellor has said he wants to have as many full Z degree programs as possible. We also wanna enhance OER discoverability. This was, um, this was an issue that came up on the survey that a lot of people just don't know where to find OER resources still. So we're looking at ways to, as I mentioned, with the curriculum builder tool to maybe um, make it easier for folks to identify um, open materials that are available to them. And then, so those are kind of in the next year or so. Even further out, well, where are we gonna go with open pedagogy? I'm not sure. We're hoping that this will turn into something that, instruct, that really resonates with instructors. We had our first round of, um, of, of Chancellor's Learning Scholars, and we introduced this idea to them, and we have heard anecdotally that a number of the faculty learning communities have been looking at open pedagogy, but we haven't seen the results of that yet, so we're not sure how that's gonna go. We're also working on some high-impact practices 
um, working with a committee next year probably to start looking at what are the high impact practices that we can see not only for um, the adoption of OER on campus, you know, just by the numbers, but also how does that impact student success and retention. And then even longer term than that, looking at things like AI and adaptive learning, you know, this is where the publishers are going. You know, we've made a big impact on the content side of things and reducing the cost of that. But if they're just going to come back, you know, a couple years from now and say, well, here's a, it's not a textbook, it's an adaptive learning platform, right? And so that's why you should spend $150 on it. Then that's something we need to be prepared to, to address. And uh, there is no great answer for this. There's no open source adaptive learning platform that is um, going to compete with what the publishers are creating right now. So we are keeping an eye on things and um, looking and, and you know, being ready to, to jump on that when the time is right. And that's it for me. So I will stop there and see if there's any questions. I know it's almost lunchtime, but yeah. I'm going to feel bad if I don't get at least one question. <laughs> yes? When you hand out grants, do you have like a, a set of criteria that you focus on, like common courses would get them, or the deep, deep course, deep degrees would get them? Do you, do you show the people who are applying with, um, how the favorites are going to be treated? Yeah, so, so there, is a, there is a rubric. When, if you go to our grants page that I mentioned on our website, we, um, the, there were kind of three main sort of red icons, and the, the far right one had to do with grants. If you go there, you'll see kind of the, all the information about the grants and what the rubric is. There's kind of a base level rubric that our reviewers are doing. Um, you know, is it, is it, does it look reasonable? Is it addressing a need? Is it, do they have the faculty expertise? The layer that you're talking about, you know, is it gonna help us move towards a full degree program? That's kind of that extra layer that, that we put on top. Now, now fortunately, we have um, been able to kind of, um, you know, the, the, we've had enough money that this hasn't been, you know, it's, it's a competitive grant process, yes, but anything that we've really wanted to do at the system level, we've been able to do as well as the, the very highly ranked ones um, that have been ranked. We haven't had, that, haven't had to make the very hard decisions yet. Yes? So it's a service level agreement. We are all part of the university system and there is a strong central system office presence. So we don't have to have a contract because we are all part of the same you know, Board of Regents University system. It's a service level agreement and it just says, you know, you agree, it's, it's very short, you, you agree that you're gonna um, you know, do the work that you say you're going to do as outlined in the proposal and um, you agree that you're not gonna you know, do anything that's against you know, Georgia policy and um, yeah, here's the people on the team, you attach the, the statement of work, and then we send them, we get it signed by somebody in their office. Sometimes it, the procedures locally are different, sometimes it has to go through their official grants office, sometimes it doesn't, but we just need a signature from whoever they feel is the appropriate person. Yes. Yeah, as I said, we do, we are, so the question was, who do we have to convince to get that no cost, low cost indicator in there? Um, so as I said, we do have a pretty strong central office presence who can kind of decide and announce, right? Um, so I convinced my, um, my immediate boss, Tristan Denley, who's the executive vice chancellor, and then he went to the chancellor. And the chancellor said, this seems like a fantastic idea, let's do it, and we did it. And again, that, you know, what's the, you know, what is the negative consequence if they don't do it? To, you know, to be determined. You know, it's still, I'm, I'm, right now we're still in the please do this phase. We're not in the you still haven't done it. You got it. You know, what, what do you, we have a couple of people who are clearly struggling with this and I'm not sure how much of a, a stick there is going to be in the end, but um, most people have done a, a good job of getting it in at least kind of the basic level of compliance. Okay, please join me in thanking Lucy again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.